I'm so pleased to be here at E-Town. Uh, you know, I'm really a Jaybird. I'm a Jaybird because I got an honorary doctorate back in 1999 here at Elizabethtown College. But now to come back where I have a little time to really explore the campus and what's offered here and to meet faculty and to discuss with students, pretty, pretty uh, electrifying in terms of the strength that I can see from this academic institution. So um, I know Hasina is going to have a lot to talk to you about, but with her permission, and I think she said okay before, we thought we might do a tour de table and let each of you introduce yourself. You'll make some comments first and then let them introduce themselves. No, sure. I, I think the only request I have is that if we can sit closer together so it feels like it's, we're having a conversation. <laughs> You don't want to sit here? Here, two seats here. I like the cow. <laughs> <laughs> Great, no, I think we can go around and, and have everybody introduce themselves and then we'll talk. And when you introduce yourself, give your name, anything you want to say about yourself briefly, maybe 30 seconds, but also like why you came tonight. <laughs> It might be kind of fun because we might be able to direct some of our comments to your motivation. Do you mind if we start off with you? Sure. Since you're I'm a high. senior. I major in sociology. I'm minoring in business. And I came here because I read about both you guys and I have similar views for both of you. I want to learn more about, about both of you. Right. Oh, thanks, Robert Russell. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Lauren. Um, I'm an early childhood special ed major. I'm a senior. And I think we both came because we we're supposed to have dinner on Thursday with you, so for your <laughs> lecture. <laughs> I'm um, Shana Perella. I'm a senior, and I'm early childhood education and special ed also. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, my name is Maureen Docker. I'm a junior occupational therapy major in the master's program, um, and I came here tonight just to learn and have an open mind to see what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Annie. I'm a senior as well, and I'll be meeting you on Thursday as well at Leffler. And um, I'm studying international relations and peace and conflict resolution, so I'm really interested in what you guys have to share with your experiences and your stories. Hi, uh, my name is Bing. Uh, I'm a junior and I'm bio-pre-med. And I love to listen to people from different areas. I'm an international student, so. Mm, that's, that's very good. Yeah. Should we go to the freshmen in the back? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark Harmon. I'm professor of English and German here, but I'm also professor of international studies. So, Excellent. Uh, I thought this, the, your, your, the idea of a conversation between two people is obviously different, you know, from such different backgrounds as both of you would be very interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of people, are, like a lot of people, are interested in Afghanistan and what's happening there, especially women's issues. I think that's why I came. Kind of that's great. Um, I'm Colleen. Um, I'm a sophomore here, and um, I be I came because I was interested in hearing what um, basically uh, what your views on like women's issues were and things. I'm Jenny. I'm a freshman. Um, I came because my friend couldn't stop talking about how excited she was. I was really excited. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. She was like, "Come with me." And I was like, oh, "That's great." I'm Tara. Um, I came because I graduated in May and I still don't have a job. <laughs> and so I thought maybe you could insight. You just today. graduated this year? Yeah. Back in May. What's your what was your I was of pro major? writing major and com and creative writing minor. Mm -hmm. Great, great, right? Well, creative writing. She's one of my former students. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's all his fault. <laughs> 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 and, and introduce yourself to everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Kennedy. I am a junior English pro writing major, and I am the production assistant here at Bowers. But of mm -hmm. course, I'm interested. In what yes, yes, today. yes, we appreciate that. That's really great. Really well, we just thought we truly would have a conversation, find out whatever it is that you're interested in, and um, and respond to you. Uh, would you like to start? 
I would like to start and uh, because I'm curious to know how um, how and when did you decide to um, to become a politician <laughs> and <laughs> so well, you, I always well have. and then we'll have to I, I guess I'd be happy to comment on that but then we're gonna have to get involved with you like how did you get started with women in Afghanistan and education and writing and all the things that you do. Well, as for me, as I have said to some students, I think that when you run for office, you should have a reason. It shouldn't really be for power. It should be some issue that motivates you, some, something that makes you, makes you feel you could change it for the better, the concept of public service. And although when I think about when I was in college and even in high school, I was very much involved with student activities. Again, my, my um, uh, plea to you to be involved, get involved with people, get involved with organizations, uh, so that you, this is part of your education, you can learn a lot more. So I held office in both of those instances, but never thought of myself as running for office. And until I was appointed to a commission for women in Montgomery County, Maryland, at a time when there was a promotion of commissions for women because a woman in Congress had introduced the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. And we had to get the states to approve it. You needed, do you know how many states you need to approve a constitutional amendment? Well, you need 38. And so I lobbied in my state of Maryland to get my state to, to, uh, um, to pass uh, passed the resolution in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. At the same time, uh, on that commission, I began to look around at equity for women, and there wasn't any. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to be a Rhodes Scholar, the mere fact that you're a woman excluded you, I mean, automatically. Uh, if you wanted to be a, a professor, small chance, um, possibility that you could be a a teacher in an elementary school in a rural community, certainly never president of a college. And yeah, the guess. What, what year was that? I'm sorry? What year is that? Well, <clears throat> this is before your parents were probably born. It's 1972. 1972. As a matter of fact, something else happened in 19... Oh, incidentally, um, the Equal Rights Amendment that was passed by Congress only because um, the woman who introduced it uh, had a discharge petition. Any of you who know government discharges if the committee will not look at your legislation. And you can get a certain number of signatures for a petition to discharge it from that committee, you know, onto the rules committee to come onto the floor. And it was done because um, the man who chaired the Judiciary Committee, Emanuel Seller, would not let it out of this committee. But it was signed by President Nixon. Most people don't realize that President Nixon signed it. That very same year, he also signed um, Title IX of the Civil Rights uh, Act. Title IX makes a difference, doesn't it, Gales? Because it is equity uh, wherever federal money is uh, being given by the federal government in sports, sports here, in higher education. And when you think of the Olympics and you think of um, the great awards that women got, then you realize, hey, Title IX has made a difference uh, uh, in, in sports as well as in other facets of education. So, okay, I just thought I want a seat at the table so I can change some things for the better. And that was what decided, that's why I decided to run. So I say the women's movement put the movement into me. Okay, now you tell us about you and then I'll elaborate as anyone desires. How did you get involved? What brought you here? To but the I, I still want to know, like, <laughs> <laughs> what, how, this was a motivation that you had already? Well, there must have been something it was in awareness. You. It was awareness. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, hey. But not know. everybody that would have uh, a position would have that ambition to do right. that. The, pa the passion to make a difference. Yes, not everybody has it, or maybe they, maybe they um, direct it in different directions to do different things, or maybe they try to transcend difficulties, you know, with their own uh, apparatus. 
but for me, I, I liked I liked serving people. Um, I thought, well, I think this is what I'll do. Some people encourage me, but quite frankly, women don't usually get the kind of encouragement that men get when they seek office. And so I would say to women, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait for a whole group to say, oh, you've got to run for office, we'll all support you. But develop your own uh, constituency to support, to, to support you. And so on. Um, Do you come from a family who were in politics? No, no. Yeah. My, my husband, though, I must say, um, he is a lawyer. And uh, at one point, he did work for a man who later became the mayor of New York. He worked, but he was in Congress first. John Lindsay, does that name ring a bell for any of you? It probably does for you. When John Lindsay was in Congress, my husband was his legislative assistant, you know. And then he helped uh, Rockefeller when he was running for president. He was the Maryland chairman. Uh, these names don't mean much to you, but they're part of that tradition of the so-called moderate Republican, which is an endangered plus almost extinct species. <laughs> and our senator, Senator Mac Mathias, my husband did a lot of work for him. Now I'm talking, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the 60s. I got involved in the 70s. Right? And, but let's hear from you and then we'll get back to me and maybe I'll have some questions. So who would you like to know? I want to know what brought you here. What, what? E-Town? Yeah. <laughs> or at this house? <laughs> no, just in general to the United States. To the United States. It's, well, you've lived here for well, many, many years. I, I you're a citizen. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to write this book so then I don't have to explain this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, Yes, well, when I left Afghanistan in 1978 because of the Russian invasion. Right. And then the other place to come was really the United States because my father graduated from UCLA. And uh, he thought that this would be this, the best place for him to come and possibly live and, and, and work and things. So, uh, so we came to U.S. and um, you don't want me to tell you the whole story of why we're here and what we're doing. I mean, it's been, it, that was 1978. We left Afghanistan and we arrived to the United States in 1980. And I was 19 years old then. So, um, they do doing mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, life has been uh, challenging and, and very exciting. And in fact, uh, Living in America is not was not easy, of course not. but uh, learning the language and we all studied French. Um, then um, had to learn English and English was um, not really an easy language. I can't say, but it was. Uh, it just uh, it may, I can't speak French anymore. By the time I graduated from high school, we all because we had French teachers. And we all spoke French, and then suddenly, you know, it, now I, when people speak, I understand what they're saying, but I can't. When I start, if I start speaking French, I speak all these other languages that I don't even know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and now I, I've gone back to Afghanistan since 2001. How often, how often do you go back? I live there. In Afghanistan? Yes, I moved back, I should say. I, I moved back to Afghanistan and um, and I come to United States about once a year for sure because my family all live in, in California and my, my one brother lives in, in Portland. Um, other than that, um, and it's usually for work, so I combine a work and a, and a family visit trip together because it's a very long flight sitting on that flight for 14, 13, 14 hours is, is very long. So I, and then on top of that, you have to deal with jet lag, which is another very strange experience because you're really busy for the first week all day long and you sleep in very odd hours. And so I, I don't really come very often unless it's work. But what I think is that they might like to hear about that I think is interesting is your work with education. 
um, educating Afghan women. And you might want to you might want to share that. Yes. So what I do there, and the reason that I actually moved back was because. Um, I went back to Afghanistan in, in 1999 when I established some clandestine underground classrooms for, for young girls um, in, in five different classrooms. It was, there were 250 girls. Um, so that really I was waiting for the Taliban to be defeated so I could go back home and not only see the girls to do more because the all, all the schools for the women were banned, and the women were banned from going to school or working, which was very strange for me to accept. That's why I went back in 1999 because um, I, when I grew up, um, we, education was compulsory for all Afghans. The fact that we don't have, our, we still have a very high illiteracy rate in Afghanistan is because they didn't have access to schools, and there were not enough schools for everybody. But wherever there were schools, education was compulsory. And um, not only that, that I grew up in a family where my mom worked. I mean, she she opened the very first florist in Afghanistan. She brought the first popcorn machine to Afghanistan. My aunts were all teachers, and uh, my mother worked in the very, f there was only one travel agency back then in the 70s. So she worked there, and then she was working at the American Embassy, and my aunts all worked. Um, her aunt became the first Afghan women senator in the 60s. So it was very hard for me to accept the fact that suddenly, you know, women couldn't go to school or couldn't work. Um, so in 2001, after September 11, I was very excited to go back home and, and see what we could do to help the, the girls who missed seven years of, of schooling. Because suddenly we had 18 year olds sitting on second and third grade in 2002. So that's what I do. I, I, I help the Afghan women who didn't go to school during the Taliban period and then also before that because we had wars in Afghanistan since 1979. So um, during the Russians uh, there were problems also outside of the city but then when the Russians were defeated um, these groups of Mujahideen who were fighting the Russians who were in Pakistan, um, they came into Kabul and they started fighting amongst themselves. So that, during that 10 years, there were no schools really. People, people were terrified of getting out of their homes because they were rocketing left and right and everything was, the whole city was totally destroyed. Um, so people missed, you know, we, we were like a good, 20 years of uh, education, and now we're trying to so you, help them catch up. You, you kind of, from your background, you kind of came from the elite class. When you consider in Afghanistan, 80% um, of the people are illiterate, so you really were a, a major step ahead, and I guess naturally a leader because of all that, mm. that you had. So, um, I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point. At any rate, I went from my state legislature to the federal Congress, and I then joined the body that is the brunt of comedians' comments. You hear it now on Jay Leno, of course, and some of these other programs. But it was uh, um, Mark Twain who <clears throat> said uh, that, um, uh, he said, suppose you were an idiot and suppose you were a member of Congress. Oh, but I repeat myself. <laughs> and um, we had uh, another another comedian whose statue, as a matter of fact, Will Rogers, is just outside the Capitol. This big statue of Will Rogers, and people go by it and touch the toe mm -hmm. and make the bronze kind of shine for for good luck. And he said Congress had, is a, a a real source of amazement, astonishment, and discouragement. <laughs> he also said, um, Congress is a place that starts off each day with a prayer. It does, and ends with an investigation. Now, we all laugh at that, because we say, sure, you know, they, they love the place, which is why they joke about it. 
Um, and but there is also there is also something um, just outside the house chamber, which is Alexander Hamilton. Here, sir, the people govern. And so it is the first branch of government. And I feel as a former member of Congress, sort of a partner, in other words, it's in your, it's in your spirit. And so I, um, I would like to do all I can um, and have people do all they can to promote the whole concept of working together just like you do here at E-Town. You can disagree, but it is meant to be a deliberative body. It is meant to be deliberative. Things aren't easy. No, people don't come with the same idea about everything. It is one of the most diverse bodies. I mean, we have a funeral director, a psychiatrist, teachers, lawyers. Um, we have farmers. Uh, we have from all over the country, and it's a diverse country, all coming together, which is a great opportunity. But now there is the shutdown. And I had predicted that there would not be a shutdown. You know, that shows how smart I am. Um, and the reason I did is because I was in Congress during the last shutdown. And that went on 28 days. It went on for a period of time in November, and then back to, back to um, operation in operation, and a period of time in December, into January, and then on top of it was a blizzard. It was just an absolutely incredible. And I represented 18 federal agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Food and Drug Administration, National Naval Medical Center, et cetera. All of these people had problems because they were considered not essential. Can you imagine? And right now with this shutdown, there is a, a Nobel laureate in science who, who was furloughed at, from NIST. Isn't that ironic? So that uh, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. But the reason, one of the reasons, I, I thought to myself, how could they have been so stupid? Because it's costly. It's very costly when you have a shutdown for a lot of different reasons. I'm on the uh, uh, American Battle Monuments Commission, which takes care of the American cemeteries overseas. I mean, like Normandy is one of them. This is sacred ground. This is sacred ground. They're closed. So you have people going over there. They can't even go onto the cemetery. It is closed. So it's affected people, and of course, it's affected the pocketbooks. Um, and services uh, of a lot of people. But as I looked at it, I realized that 37 out of 232 Republicans were not there, were there during the last shutdown, were there, only 37. So others never had the experience. Mm. They never knew, really. You know, they were in their states and really not bothered by it. And then I also looked at some statistics, and almost 50% of the current Republicans were elected after President Bush left office. So they're new, and they came in at one time. <laughs> and so the poor Speaker of the House, with whom I serve, John Boehner, I mean, yeah, he can't keep them in order. In fact, just before I came, I had television on, and earlier he had said, I think we're going to have something tonight. Well, now all of a sudden they had nothing tonight. And the reason is he went back to his group, again, mostly new people, and they weren't going to go along with something. And he does not want to take a vote and have to depend on the Democrats for it to pass because he'll lose his credibility in his own caucus. He might have to do that, though. So he'd go down a hero but he wouldn't stay in office, but that's all right. Yeah, you got a hero. Um, I have a question, um, because there's a local issue here, is that we have a congressman who really should not be in Congress. And Joe Fitz? Yeah. And, um, and liberal Republicans would say that too. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, uh, he will continue to be reelected because of the nature of Lancaster County and the other areas that have kind of been gerrymandered to form a district. But, so. He, 
he ne he'll never, he doesn't face any challenger. Uh, he can make a laughing stock of himself in Congress, and he'll be re-elected. You're exactly with, right. Do you mind if mm -hmm. I continue talking sure, no, a little no, of bit? Course. I don't want to. I don't want to take. No, she no. has so much to offer. So I hope you will ask her some questions. But I, I feel very strongly about what you said, and um, and that the the fifty or forty plus people who are holding things up are representing their constituencies well. Their constituencies are saying, yeah, shut down, we want to reduce the size of government, you're spending too much, et cetera, et cetera. Who are they? They were put into um, special districts. Every 10 years, as you know, is the census where they look at the number of people in the country, whether they're here legally or illegally. And then from that, they, uh, for Congress, 435 seats is the permanent number then they will look at redesigning their districts according to whether they gained a seat, lost a seat because of population, because each district is uh, close to about 600,000 people. And that's when the legislators in the state do the carving, with, with a few exceptions. There are a few states where they have bipartisan commissions. So if you have a Republican state, you have Republican legislators in your state, and they're doing the carving. Do you think they're going to, to, to try to make it even or include the Democrats? No. The, the same happens with the Republicans in, in Texas. Let's use that as an example. And they're also going to carve it. Uh, then, on top of that, to exacerbate that with crazy districts, came from Governor Gary from Massachusetts, designed a district that looked like a salamander, and that's how they call it, gerrymander, from, from that. Um, but on top of that is who elects these people? No, August is the new November because they're elected in primaries because they have a safe seat. Who votes in primaries? Now let me ask you, how many of you voted in the last primary election? Were you eligible to vote in the last primary election? I had just become a U.S. citizen, so... <laughs> but you voted. Yeah. Bravo, yeah. I bet you the new citizens we have do vote. You know, they know a lot about American government. <laughs> uh, but, but were you all eligible to vote in the primary, when the last primary? See, some of you might not have been eligible, but some of you were. But even if you asked your parents, if you said, did you vote in the last primary, mom, dad? They'll think about it and they'll say, oh, but I voted in the election. But they mean November. So what I'm saying to you is the number of people who vote in primaries is very low, very low. So you can find somebody is elected with a, with a very sh small amount of people who vote. And those are the people who care very much about certain issues to the left or to the right, I think. But why is it? That because they don't, don't vote. vote. Well, the good question. I think they should fine them. No, they will never do it. But but actually, assess them. <laughs> no, but you know, I, I say that. <laughs> but I can say year, Australia does. Pay taxes. Australia <laughs> does. They pay a small amount if they don't vote in a primary, and they have like a ninety percent voting. They've done it since nineteen twenty-five. They'll never do it in the United States. I mean, we just feel never we would we. we, we charge or tax somebody for not voting. So maybe we want to have uh, a lottery <laughs> or some benefit. You vote, maybe you get a tax benefit or something like that. Yeah, or maybe you could have a certain percentage go into a, a charity. But we got to shake people up and get them to vote in primaries. And, and we have to also get people like you working in certain organizations, maybe as groups, to even now get the state legislators to come up with a law resolution that there will be a nonpartisan group to decide on the redistricting. That won't come for another eight years, but this is the time to start. And there are some movements like League of Women Voters or whatever. Maybe it's just too complicated for people. Uh, what is too complicated? So, the whole voting, so is, do you understand well, all of that? I think you're, you know, I think, I think you're right. It's too bad. 
But I, I know that Maryland has had a lot of, even this was even after I was out of politics. We have one district in Maryland, District 3, the third district of Maryland, that is like in four counties, parts of it. And, and a reporter once said, you know, you could take a drop of blood and you could throw it on the wall and it will splatter. That is the third district of Maryland. It's the worst in the country. I mean, it truly is. Uh, now, people go to vote. Oh, I didn't know that I was in this district. They don't even know it happened because they've been too busy with their own life. I thought I, I, thought I was represented by so-and-so, but I don't even see his or her name on the ballot. And so people have got to become aware of it. Um, but maybe the question is then why people are so detached from politics. First of all, Congress's rating is 10%. It's lower than it's ever been. And you know, it's so interesting. I just, I got on my, on my Blackberry today, a poll that you will see in Esquire magazine, and I think NBC is picking up on it. Does this sound familiar to you, Jesse? It's saying that Americans are very upset with Congress and that they are moderates, that they are centrists whether they're Democrats or that they are centrists. It was an incredible poll. And I'm hoping that I can actually, you know, graphically get it and, and look at it and see what I can discern about, about places. People care about their jobs. They care about doing their homework, what grade they're going to get, what the job is they're going to get, what they're looking for. They've got activities and friends and family. And so politics is that, it's now become unfortunately sort of that Dirty business, I won't bother with it. And then you are barraged with ads, and the ads are not nice ads. <laughs> well, right yeah, now. but if they don't get involved, you know, then suddenly their brother goes off to Afghanistan and dies. There you go. And, and then what? And then they you, have no clue you would why. Be, you would be good to tell, to talk to a group of people about that very thing. Say, well, I don't understand why Americans don't get involved because, you know, you could have somebody go to Afghanistan and not come back. I mean, I think that's really very true. That'll be October 29th, because <laughs> of you may be interested. We'll be having a, uh, Hasina will be here with one to two other folks uh, talking about the Afghanistan issue as it relates to the United States, um, our interaction with Afghanis, and then the past, present, and future of Afghanistan and our interaction with that is a very, very important issue, particularly because, as we have said before, Americans are getting war weary. Um, they're saying, hey, this has been like 10 plus years. We're having troubles with Hamid Kazai. We're having troubles with contractors. I mean, we want our people home. I mean, uh, so it'd be very interesting what you can shed on it. And as you know, I've been supportive of Mrs. Bush, Laura Bush's work with women in Afghanistan, trying to get them educated. And um, uh, I, I just think that whole issue, so I'm glad you brought that up, will be a very be a very good one. Do you, do you see, was there a hand up? I wasn't sure, do we, do we have some questions? Do we maybe want to open it up to some yeah. questions? I think we should open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, come on, everybody should have at least one question. I have a comment that I can make. Oh, good. Well, yes, comments or questions or, or suggestions, too. Um, I was going to say, I come from a smaller area in Delaware, and um, all of my friends who are my age or even a few years older that may go to the University of Delaware, if you ever ask anybody like what they think about current politics, the resounding answer will be that they're not interested and that they stay out of it. That concerns mm -hmm. me greatly. Uh, as, as Jesse knows, I did an op-ed for the Baltimore Sun on how this shutdown, uh, furloughs, uh, attitudes that people have about people who work for the federal government are not only turning people off about politics, running for office themselves or getting involved, but even working for the federal government. You know, thinking even of Peace Corps, Foreign Service, uh, all of these issues. So. It, it's an environment, some of it of our own making. I mean, when we have the media with these terrible commercials and all the money that goes into politics, and of course right now, that polarization where no side wants to give in. Hey, you know what? 
We need more women in, <laughs> in Congress. The statistics in yesterday's paper, there were statistics that pointed out that women are better financial advisors. Mm. You know, if you've got more women involved. And I think that, that they have also demonstrated that women somehow will try to bring bring sides together a little more readily than men. Uh, I mean, we can get angry at somebody and still smile. <laughs> That's pretty disconcerting. <laughs> and so, you know, that uh, that truly really might might be one of the things that makes a difference. But we need to get. Um, we need to get more young people involved. Oh, they did another poll. They did a poll at Harvard. I know you were at Harvard. I was a resident fellow in 2008 at the Institute of Politics. And Hasina is back and forth at Harvard and I think got a degree there. Uh, but they did a poll of some of the students in government in the Institute of Politics. And they all were excited about public service. But then were they going to get involved with the government or run for office? No. And that coming from the seat of government, you know, these are, these are majors, is, is disconcerting. So you're right. Incidentally, you speak about Delaware? Yeah. Ah, there's your example. When Mike Castle is defeated by Christine O'Donnell, you know, and he would have been elected, um, and she lost. This was a primary where there was a woman who had no experience, I mean, all for women running for office, she had no experience on one of the programs. She had even said she was a witch or something like that. And the signs are terrible because, like, the signs that, um, like, the advertising signs, the campaigning signs, every single one of them would have, like, it would basically be vandalized. Is that there right? There would be, like, is a witch added to it or stuff like so that. So even vandalizing her signs. But oh, she especially that. And it wasn't even for just one side, though. It would be both sides. Yeah. She, see, she, she won because of a primary. That's the very thing we're getting at. She won because she got voters out in a primary and beat the other guy who had served in Congress, had been governor, and now was running for the Senate. You know, I mean, he knew Delaware well. So that's a great example. Dick Lugar is another example. Yeah. Okay, come on, some more questions. A question for you. Um, you mentioned before that you got involved in um, setting up clandestine classrooms for young girls. What motivated you um, to go that route with your life and help young girls back in Afghanistan uh, learn how to read and be educated? Well, um, it's a bit of a long story, but I'll give you a, a short version of it. Um, when I went back into Afghanistan in 1999, after 19 years, to see it for myself, because I, I, everybody knew that women were, were banned from working and girls were banned from going to school. Um, so just being there and talking to a lot of the Taliban leaders um, and realizing that I wasn't going to get anywhere after a whole week of talking to them, they finally told me that, you know, there's nothing we can do for you because order comes from up above and we implement it. And they were keeping their own daughters and wives in Pakistan because they wanted their daughters to go to school. So it was a big question and then I thought, you know, it's a waste of time here. Now I have a week left. So I really wanted to do something once I was there and, and seeing all these teachers who were 70% of all the teachers in Kabul were all women. So they were all out on the streets begging to feed their children. And, and many of them told me that the, their children didn't know that their mother was out begging. Um, so it wasn't every day that somebody was coming from anywhere outside of Afghanistan. Um, suddenly, you know, everybody knew, and although I, I tried to dress, uh, I. I Modestly, where I took, I bought. I actually, I took a an old um, outfit from a friend in Pakistan with me back home, and then I had to wear the burqa. And have you seen the burqa? Oh, they all know what a burqa is. Yeah. So, um, for the first time, you know, and this thing is really difficult to breathe, even, and, and because it's all nylon, and you have a tiny little net that goes from the, in the middle of your eyes, and you have no peripheral vision at all. 
walking with it, it's something else. I mean, walking down the airplane, I, I was gonna roll down. I had no idea you had to learn how to walk with it. You, you have to hold it down like this so you can see your feet. And um, then I didn't, I had $3,000 with me and I didn't want to take this $3,000 back with me to America. So, and I, there was nothing else. I, I went into Kabul thinking that I'm going to convince the Taliban to reopen the girls' schools. And that was not gonna happen, obviously. Mm -hmm. So the only other thing that I could think of was after talking to these teachers every day, they would just come to where I was staying. Um, I thought, you know, we can do something. And, and I asked them if it's possible to organize. Uh, they said, in fact, that many of them already were doing it on their own because they were not going to uh, let these young girls just do nothing. So they were already organizing things in their own little area, having the neighbors' kids coming, you know, and just teaching them for an hour or two per day. So I said, well, can we do something? So they organized, and five of the teachers we identified that, that were all widows, and they had like five to nine kids. Um, so we set up the classrooms within their homes. I would go very early, I found a, an old man who um, had a taxi, and he would take me to these teachers' homes very early in the mornings. Um, so we did all of that within a week, and I sent somebody to buy books and stationery and everything that they needed. And then I was sending money to this man in Pakistan to pay the teachers in Afghanistan. And it was a very risky thing for him to do, actually, because if the Taliban found out, they would have killed him. Um, so yeah, it just kind of happened. You know, once once you're there, you just feel like you, you need to do something. And, and prior to going into Afghanistan, I was already involved in, in providing education for Afghan refugees within, within the refugee camps in Pakistan. Did Kugel on say, how did you? You know, it was very strange. You know, now that I think back, how all that happened, I think once you're in it, you don't know once I got out, I was pretty disturbed. For a whole week, I couldn't talk to anybody. I didn't call anybody in my family. Nobody knew that I went into Afghanistan. Um, it was very shocking. I only realized that after I came out, because a city that I grew up in, when it was full of life and there was music all over the place and people, you know, it was after, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, everybody was out walking and eating and there were, there was a lot of life in the city and suddenly it was dead. All of the stores were all boarded up. What would have happened had the United States not intervened? I don't know, I, I think that if the, United, if the Afghans got, were coming to the point where they would have done something themselves. It wasn't going to go on for much longer. Um, nothing, it was, everything was dead because the only thing that the Taliban were focusing on were what women were doing. Women couldn't walk with shoes that were making noise. Skin, no, no skin could show. The, you could not wear a shoe without socks or a nylon. It had to be something that where skin doesn't show. Um, of course, they couldn't go out without an escort. Um, the, it was not really, I mean, it was miserable for women, of course, but it was miserable for everybody. Men suffered just as much, and in fact more, because there were only once or twice that women were punished and once it was killed in the in the stadium, but every Friday they would amputate, you know, feet and hands, and I don't even know where those people are now. Nobody talks about it, but it happened every week because if if somebody stole um, an apple from the the store, even because you know there were no jobs, nobody was working. There was there was a desperation, so if people stole something, you know, they would just cut his hand off. I have a feeling there was. You know, we worry about the disparity of the rich and those that are becoming whiter, as it is in many countries. I think it's the same in Afghanistan, isn't it? Back about four, mm. five years ago, when I was still in Paris, a group of 32 
Afghan women parliamentarians came over for a program. Vital Voices had the program, mm. but they met with the, uh, the U.S. ambassador. I had a reception and spoke to them, the Afghanistan ambassador. And what they couldn't wait to do was go out and shop. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so they had them. money, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> but this is unfortunately what happens is that, you know, bringing people outside of a country for training, it makes no sense, especially bringing to America. Because they bring them to America for like a two or three weeks of training. First of all, they have some, many of them have really not traveled to US before. So this big long flight and the jet lag they have to do, you're, you're, for every hour that you're traveling, it takes a day to recover. So it's a 13 hour flight. So for two weeks you're, you're jet lagged. And then after that, they go shopping. This you was bring, in Paris. They, they this was a, no, in they Paris. do this all over. Yeah, yeah they, they go shopping and bring gifts for their kids. And mm -hmm. I don't know how much learning really takes place. A spinoff on her comments is um, the young gal Malala from Pakistan. She did not get the Nobel Prize, but she is winning her battle. And that is for education for women in Pakistan. And I, I think her, her guts, her courage, she's brilliant evidently too, is radiating. And I, I think it's uh, building some strength to recognize how important education is. When you educate a woman, you are uplifting a society. It's not just her personally. And, and I think you're interested in foreign assistance. I think our foreign assistance should do more with empowering women uh, in other countries uh, in terms of education. You educate a woman, then she's going to educate her kids, um, she's going to watch out for her family more, keep them from, you know, HIV AIDS or early pregnancy, I mean, ev everything. It, uh, all the studies have pointed that. Um, but why, I think it's interesting to, to see that why do we wait for things like like what happened to her, yeah. or like September 11, to pay attention to something. Right. You know, I mean, I think we all know that that without education, you really can't have a democracy mm -hmm. anywhere, mm -hmm. and without education, no no development takes place, or or no society will really develop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for Pakistan has been a very problematic country and um, and I'm sure that people know in the government that there must be I think Pakistan has a lot uh, the, the literacy rate in Pakistan is much higher than Afghanistan but still of course there are a lot of villages who people yeah. don't mm -hmm. have access mm -hmm. or there are uh, for the same reason as she was shot as Malala was shot, you know, there are fundamentalists around who don't want girls to go to school. Mm -hmm. um, and the same same thing with Afghanistan. I mean, I, I think if the United States really cared about Afghanistan, they would have gone in in mm -hmm. 1997. But then it took September 11, unfortunately, and, and life of 3,000 Americans before we paid attention to what's happening. Yeah, I know we seem but then if people get involved crisis. in primaries, Maybe. <laughs> You've got some sensible government. <laughs> she got that one back. <laughs> that was a great, a great way to bring things up full circle. If, um, if we could, one, if, if we have maybe one or two more questions, uh, we could field those, and then we can go into the dining room for some chocolate oh, fondue and idea. snacks and just maybe sort of Maybe we should ask everybody to, to ask one question if they haven't or yeah, make a comment. I have a comment. Good. Okay. I think that like my generation doesn't really <laughs> care about politics because they follow what they see on social media, which is completely wrong. But that's but, but that's what they do. And it's like I want to run to be a state rep in 2016, mm -hmm. and like my future opponent is Republican, and so am I. He's he's very very conservative. I'm more on the moderate side. Mm -hmm. So that means I have to win in the primaries. Now he'll probably win most of the votes for the ages 50 plus. But if I can get the kids my age to vote, I will take that by a landslide. 
So I'm, the thing is, I want to focus on the kids, but also changing the minds of the people that are 50 years and older because it's hard to change their mind to vote for someone new because he's been in office for the past 20 years. So people are used to him, who? Matt Baker. He is, He's a state rep to uh, Harrisburg, so I mean, oh, not too, but not, not you're, too. Uh, you're going to run for the state state yeah. legislature. You're thinking of. Yeah, that's a that's a step to what I want to do for like a major goal. But are there things that he has done that you would not do? I mean, you've got some issues. You want to have some issues too, and then you want to plan your strategy and and just it. Boy, uh, President Obama did well with the young people. Um, he's losing some of them now, but. Uh, young people again have so many things on their minds and you all do you have so many things in your mind that to get you to concentrate for a long time on something other than your studies or your job is not easy and for adults I know it's not easy either but um, you will have to talk about that yeah because you, you want to I'm very very passionate about a lot of topics that are affecting my my area well, but also the one for our state as well okay well maybe you will have a chance in the next day or so or something I'd love to hear your comments too good yeah. um, I was just gonna say that I think all the things that you both are talking about um, I definitely want to take that and embed it into my future classroom I think that that can be started in early childhood social studies you know creating effective citizens and making them aware and educated about politics so you know Sandy Day O'Connor a chief a justice on the one of the Supremes, as I would say. Um, right now, what she's doing is she's working on um, civics education. Yeah. She's got a, a center because this is what she laments. She said, "You know, Americans just don't know politics. You know, and maybe that's why they don't get yeah, it all right. starts." Right. Yeah, I think even going off of that, like even in college, like in education classes, I feel like it would be beneficial to talk about this kind of stuff in our education classes, like in the mm -hmm. college curriculum. I think it would yeah, be really cool yeah. to have that when we go, you, you, it's our future, like we need to know like, this current event and stuff. Suggest that if mm -hmm. you had a few other students in your class yeah. who agreed with you and just say, you know, could we introduce such and such? Right. You probably don't want to do it alone. <laughs> you don't have to get a grade. I can take one with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh, you can go. No, no, no you're fine. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question for the two of you. Um, the, for the students and for the people studying peace and conflict studies, applying them to international relations and international conflicts, a lot of times you see people really stress the importance of working with the local level, on the local level, with NGOs, the importance of education, and more of long-term social reforms and changes. But I was wondering what you saw I do agree that that's very important. I completely agree with it, 100%. But I was wondering, on the other, on the flip side, that some people believe that it's a waste of time to try and work on the political level as well, when in terms of finding conflict resolution, negotiation, arbitration. And I was wondering, through your experiences, what how you view that in terms of international conflicts and the importance of working more on the political level. On the, at the same time as working with the local level, when it comes to needing to work with social reforms, political reforms, to kind of restore balance or social stability in a country? I don't think one excludes the other at all. Mm -hmm. I, I, what we're saying is you don't all have to get involved in politics or work on a campaign, although I think it's a pretty good idea, you know, even if you just work on a campaign for the experience, but you have to know your government, that you're a citizen. I mean, this is the best form of government that there is, you know, and you are the ones that make the difference. At the same time, I think it is critically important that you recognize that this is, you know, the world is flat, as that book by Tom Friedman mm -hmm. has, but there are bumps in it. <laughs> and we try to straighten out the bumps. And when I was at OECD, which came from the Marshall Plan, we worked by, there were now 34 ambassadors from the 34 most industrialized countries in the world. And we work by consensus. Consensus is diplomacy. Diplomacy is what you do in everything. Uh, we had to all agree. So it took a little longer. In fact, I said to them one day, I said, you know, we could, we could as a logo, come up with a turtle. Because a turtle takes a little longer to get to the destination. Um, sticks its neck out 
and it has a hard shell. And you know, and then someone says, oh, because you're from Maryland. You know, the Turks are <laughs> Maryland gene. But, but, but truly, it takes a little longer because you're listening and you're learning and you're working it out. And, and that, that's the beauty, I think, of um, a, a, you know, our international organizations, OECD, of course, the UN, uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, there are a lot of them. And I think it's great to get involved Involved but then everything too. is politics. It might look like you're working for an international organization, but there's politics <clears throat> involved. So it's it's all intertwined because if you're not really involved, then it it will definitely affect you. Okay, thank you. I think everything's politics. <laughs> uh, everything's politics. I mean, right here on this campus. <laughs> your, 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 your personal life I is politics. You. I, I know. It's, it's political. <laughs> I mean, you know, politics is about people, though, you see? And, and how you work. How you work. With Dealing people. with parents and boyfriends and husbands yeah. is always politics. That's no? absolutely right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I don't really have anything to say, but I really enjoy listening to that. It's so nice that you came. Yeah, it really is. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I'm kind of in the same boat. But I was wondering, um, how do you really make people care? How do you get them educated if they don't want to be? If they're so resistant? Give them money. Give them money. Give them motivation. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but that's exactly what, what happens, you know, when people are just not motivated to get involved. And, and I think that's, uh, that's not something that you can really do for somebody. It's, uh, it's a culture that has been developed. Uh, and, and I'm doing that, I, I think, is, um, it, it's, it takes time. And, and I think somehow I have no idea how people get, they become very detached here. Where in the rest of the world are not like that. Everybody's involved. You create I think maybe it's the comfort of life. Yeah. yeah but you create an environment. Yeah, if, you create if, an environment where those where those around you people respond to other people. And some if they're living in a cocoon or they're in an environment already where education is meaningless, then it's gonna be hard. Um, but I, I think that you gotta show them what the benefits will be, what they'll be able to get, whether it's whether they'll be able to get a better job. I mean, there are statistics that show that. More opportunity for pleasure in life, satisfaction uh, in life. And again, if you had people around you that that helped to encourage them to do it. But, you know, but it's not simple. There's no magic wand then. But, it, you know, incentives. And the incentive can be just a better life. You're going to be able to get out of this rut. I'm the first in my family to go to college. I'm, I'm the daughter of immigrants. And um, they didn't have the opportunities I had. But this is why I say with all the problems in the United States, we're still, the, to me, the best country. But I, I think mean, it, there maybe are it's no, ca no well, caste system. Although I have a real problem with that. I really do. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's nationalism. And this is one of the most nationalistic countries in I the know. world. And, but it, it never uses that word of itself. But, but you know, I, I understand the connotation that you're taking from it. But when you think about it, we do not have the official caste system. If we were in some other countries, we would not be able to get the level of education that we can get. We would not be able to use that hard work ethic. The harder I work, the luckier I get. But, but you're right, we have a tendency to with the best and the brightest. Yeah, and you and we, and we you wait for other people to say that. Yeah, if they ever say that. Yeah. But, you know. And we, and we also, we also uh, many Americans in that nationalist vein, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, I believe America is, is the best country in the world because of A, B, or C. Yeah. But I do think there's real danger and damage in saying, I think America is the only country in the world that succeeds at A, B, and C. Absolutely. And I think many Ab Americans absolutely. take that stance, yeah. and that's just out of complete ignorance. Yeah. Ignorance, yeah. A Complete ignorance, yeah. and not understanding that there's so many other countries that do what we do well, and sometimes gasp even better. 
-hmm. and, and, and that's something I, I guess I wish more Americans kept their own nationalism and patriotism in check with, is to say, yeah, we're a great country. We, we, have, we have so many wonderful things in our access. Our form of government and its yeah, flexibility yeah. Mm -hmm. and its setup is a wonderful, wonderful model. But then to, but then to assume that it's the only thing in oh, the no, world I agree. I agree. Is, is so dangerous. Because the arrogance is dangerous. Absolutely. The arrogance can really take you down, and then that's the end. But also, I, I think what you said is because people here seems to only think of their own little community. If your own little community is safe, it's quiet, you know, each town is beautiful, it's nice, you know, we don't have to deal anything with anybody else outside. Not realizing that we are not very far from one another, whether it's Afghanistan and America, became very close when September 11 happened. So the world is not so uh, distant and, and we're, we're much closer than, than we really think we are. And it's unfortunate that if people don't realize that until something happens in their city by somebody else or some outside forces. Part of it's where we're located too. We have the oceans, uh, you know, on both sides. But I do think even in Afghanistan, they care about their own little, little, uh, their own home. And I mentioned a number of families leaving uh, to for other parts of Afghanistan or out into other countries. But our location is such that we can almost you know, feel safe without worrying. You know, they say when you speak many languages, you're multilingual, right? Yeah. When you speak two languages, you're bilingual. When you speak one language, you're American. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that. <laughs> we got to change that. <laughs> yes, a lot of Americans speak Spanish now, no? Uh, do you speak Spanish? Anybody speak Spanish? Oh, I bet some of them do. No, a lot of people oh, speak Spanish now. Yeah. Okay, let's let's continue on. Um, I have one more kind of quick comment um, on this, and then one that's actually in response to something that was said earlier. Um, I was gonna say I think another big problem with the whole thing is um, the way that people are perceiving things, um, not only in the younger generation but just in America. Because um, from what I'm aware of, at least like different studies that I've seen, um, there are like the highest depression rates that there have been in so long, and people are very egocentric in the way that they look at the world because they're getting sucked into their own minds. Um, and that really does affect, I think, the way that people are even looking at politics because they're saying that's happening on a completely different level and they don't realize how much it affects you. Mm -hmm. And for my generation, I'm kind of counting it a little bit different than uh, your generation and your generation, but um, we didn't learn very much about politics growing up, like in my school system, like. <coughs> I will be the first to admit how ignorant I am of politics, and I'm one of the more educated out of my group of friends. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think is very um, sad. Mm -hmm. I, I think admitting ignorance is a very educated thing to say. Yeah. Um, very quickly, last year, as many of you may remember, Seamus McGraw, who wrote The End of Country, was here on campus, and he spoke about an example, spe uh, giving a reading of his book, and uh, when he was at the Q&A, Every fact, he would, this is a book about fracking, specifically in the Marcellus Shale, and he would give a fact from the book or that he had found, and there was a, an individual in the back who, who kept saying, you know, no, that's wrong, that's an incorrect fact. Oh. And, and he would say, well, according to this document, this study, this body of mm -hmm. information, it is true. And this person was getting more and more irritated, and finally they told him he was wrong about something, and he again sort of checkmated this person and said, well, according to this national information, this is true. And the person said, I don't care what your facts say, I know how I feel, and I'm not changing my mind. Mm -hmm. And so wrapped up, I think, in, in all these issues that we're talking about is also, and I think it's probably true in many cultures, it's just a fierce sense of, this is how I feel, I don't care what the facts are. It sounds and like Congress. It's, <laughs> and and yeah, it's very it's Orwellian. Right. As many of yeah. you remember from Animal Farm, the sheep, mm -hmm. you know, that would just bleed, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad. And, and you can't combat that. There's no, there's no chess move for that. You know, when somebody just takes their arm and sweeps the pieces off the board, there's... 
you, you, you can't combat that. And it's, I, I, think, I don't know what your name is here. Jenny. Jenny, I think it's incredibly admirable and humble of you to say, I'm ignorant ab about this. I think it's rare mm -hmm. to see humility in people in general, but especially mm -hmm. as we're talking about potentially yeah. in, in Americans and certainly in congressmen mm -hmm. or in congresswomen. When was the last time you heard somebody from Congress say, you know, I really don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find something out about that. That's a rare individual who has the humility and grace to, to admit that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Very good comment. Okay. And, and do you have any questions um, or comments? Or I'd you? just like to say I'm really glad that the college has the opportunity to keep you guys here for an extended period of time and hold multiple events and do smaller things like this where I can actually talk to you about your experiences. How lovely of you to say that. Thank you very much. And thank you all for spending the, you know, the evening with us. You could be watching television. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. <laughs> And as I mentioned, we've got chocolate fondue and snacks next door, so I encourage you to come have a bite and keep up the conversation. And I, I think Constance and Hasina will join us, perhaps, and give you an opportunity to, yeah. to meet mm -hmm. them individually and to That'd chat with great. them. Great, good. Did I give you a chance to ask a question? Uh, no, but I would have one about Afghanistan. I mean, after the U.S. withdrawal, which seems <laughs> quite likely, yeah. what will be left? of all that. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan was not born in 2011. You know? No, but what, what, are they, what the Americans tried we to do... We will still go on. Yeah, but I mean the Russians, we'll what is back. left of the time the Russians were out there? Nothing I would imagine. No, Afghanistan is, you know, they, they, we've been invaded several times, mm. left and right, and, and then they come and they go, and, but we survive, and mm -hmm. I, I think we will survive. Mm -hmm. And um, and in fact, it might it might help us to to get ourselves together and and decide, you know, what what do we really want? How do we want Afghanistan to be? What what do we want for ourselves, which we haven't been able to do? Would we be able to keep the girls in school? Of course. The Taliban doesn't think so. Good luck. The yeah. Taliban, that's their problem. They're in the Afghanistan, they're in Pakistan. So they don't even, really know, have... They're a very political group. So when I realized that they, the leaders were keeping their own girls in Pakistan to go to school, it has really nothing to do with, I mean, the only reason they were doing all of that was to get US attention what they really believe in is something else. You know, they were they banned music, but every night for that two weeks that I was in Kabul, I, I heard music until late, late hours. And maybe the same thing with the statues. But, you know, remember the... What the Buddha? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, they had no idea why they were doing that. I mean, they, they, they have no sense of history or knowing. The uh, Taliban never really introduced themselves as Afghans. They belong to a group. It's an ideology. So they, they don't belong to a place. They don't care about Afghanistan as a country at all. They, they wanted a space to, in fact, design their <coughs> attacks on the West. They had nothing to do with Afghanistan. So and now they're in Pakistan, and I think if we just give them part of Pakistan, they'll just live there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. The goal is to divide Pakistan and give part of it to the Taliban. <laughs> okay, time for sweets. Yes, please. <laughs>